Well, as you can probably hear from my voice uh, and my uh, accent, that uh, I come from Eastern Europe, I come from Belarus, and it's not exactly um, an example of uh, liberal democracy in Europe. It's one of the countries with uh, one of the probably most repressive regimes in uh, remaining in Europe, and this is where I grew up, and for this reason I've always been uh, fascinated by the question of how you can actually open up a country like Belarus, how you can actually promote, if not democracy, then at least democratic values in a country like Belarus. No amount of internet control uh, will allow the dictator to solve the problem of unemployment or the problem of political turmoil, right? No matter how well you control the internet, if you are already facing a period of revolutionary upheaval, uh, the internet wouldn't be of much help as we've seen actually in Egypt with the Egyptian government turning it down uh, for a brief period of time uh, a few weeks ago. But it's also very important to remember that if the social media revolutions do not succeed, right, there is also much more evidence out there in the public sphere for the government to go and track down the protesters in the distance, much more than there was ever available in the pre-digital world, right, it was when protesters were still communicating uh, using analog tools or sometimes just you know talking on the phone or just meet, meeting in person. Um, and that's a troubling sign that I saw recently, again, sort of trying to position this talk more in the sort of current events. Uh, in Belarus, in my own country, there were elections last December, right, just a few months ago, and they were also followed by public protests. And a lot of people who showed up at the protests, of course, carried their mobile phones, because now everyone wants to carry a mobile phone to a protest, because it helps to mobilize, right? It helps to coordinate uh, actions. Um, and now there are reports, and of course the protests were not successful, for, for those of you who didn't know. So 600 people were arrested, there was a very brutal crackdown on the protests, uh, and, and not much was achieved. But now there are reports that the government is actually actively uh, seeking information from mobile phone networks, from the mobile phone operators, about all of their customers who showed up at the square, because it's possible to locate all of them geographically. It's possible to use data from mobile towers to identify where those people were at a certain time. Right? So the government may actually now be going and actively prosecuting some of these people if they choose to. Right? Again, we don't know whether they're doing it as, a, as just as a, a tactic to intimidate others and to make sure that next time you go to a protest, you either leave your phone at home or you pick someone else's phone. <laughs> we don't know why exactly they're doing it, but again, uh, we do know that it probably does not necessarily enhance um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the odds uh, that people will be using these technologies to, to mobilize in the future. And most of the reports that we hear about bloggers in Iran or Russia or China are produced by Western journalists who are also looking for good stories. So we end up with the stories of bloggers as agents of democratic change, promoting, uh, you know, secular democratic values, only because bloggers who promote different kind of values don't want to talk to BBC or CNN, or they just don't speak English. On many levels, uh, the promotion of internet freedom, which is not backed by any real policies up till now, right? The Clinton announced that, yes, we embrace internet freedom, and very little has been done until then. On the other hand, if you look at what has happened in terms of internet control, in the U.S. you do see a lot of very real disturbing developments. And of course, this makes America look extremely hypocritical. Other governments see that, and they jump on the opportunity to basically have the same um, kind of developments that American politicians are pushing for, and I think often they do it legitimately. Um, so again, there needs to be a much better way to connect domestic internet policy with foreign internet policy, otherwise America will end up looking extremely hypocritical. We have to be very careful about who provides the infrastructure that makes uh, this digital activism possible. Uh, again, this digital infrastructure is provided by companies like Facebook and like Twitter and like Google, and they are American companies, and as I've said, uh, it's probably not the case that they are the digital equivalents of Radio Free Europe and Voice of America. I mean, they are commercial companies with their own agendas trying to accomplish their own goals. Uh, and often those goals do not 
coincide with the goals and interests of activists, right? There are a lot of activists in the Arab world who are, for example, unhappy with the fact that Facebook does not allow its users to use the service using false names, right? If you are an activist in China and you want to use Facebook using a pseudonym, you cannot legally. And, you know, and Facebook enforces that, I mean, not legally, but according to Facebook's term of service. And Facebook enforces that policy quite aggressively. Right. And again, it subtracts from the uh, potential that uh, these tools have. Uh, but I think it also uh, <coughs> um, makes many people question to what extent uh, the policy of promoting Internet freedom will also include uh, pushing these companies to adopt more responsible policies and more responsible approaches to how they treat their users. Again, I think uh, looking at what happened uh, to Tunisia and Egypt in the last uh, you know, few months, chances are we will see many more governments becoming even more suspicious of these companies, right? In part because, uh, you know, it is true that they played a somewhat greater role in Egypt and Tunisia than they did in Iran. And again, as we have seen also in the case of Iran, it doesn't really matter what role they play. All matters is the kind of perception that, that is created, and this is what the governments react to. The policy uh, so far has been extremely inconsistent. You know, on the one hand, um, people at the State Department uh, often voice their discontent with the fact that Cisco uh, sells equipment that uh, makes the Chinese censorship system possible. On the other hand, just a few months ago, the State Department gave Cisco an innovation award and recognition of their corporate excellence. Right? And there are many other developments. Again, uh, for all their good, Twitter and Facebook, uh, the big companies that they are, have not joined uh, the Global Network Initiative, which is this group of technology companies, uh, including Microsoft, Yahoo, and Google, which basically wants to set standards on how technology companies should behave in this space when it comes to issues like freedom of expression and human rights. Uh, you know, Facebook said they don't have the resources to pay, you know, the $100 uh, annual fee uh, which, again, sounds uh, somewhat ridiculous. And again, uh, th these companies, of course, are not angels, and it's up to civil society and the media to pressure them to behave in more responsible ways. What I don't want is the government of the United States to be sending controversial messages. Again, when Twitter, who also refused to join this initiative, um, when its executives are invited uh, to dinners at the State Department and are taken on trips, around the world to tout America's, you know, Silicon Valley and innovation and new media, again, it sends a lot of controversial messages. What it tells to the world is that you don't have to be a responsible company and an ethic with, you know, with ethical commitments to be like the American government. Again, when it happens to coincide uh, with its foreign policy agenda. If you look ahead and if we want to figure out what actually should be done, which is a question, again, I'm, I'm, I'm asked a lot. I think the key thing to figure out is how to minimize uh, the pernicious impact that the quest for innovation uh, has on U.S. foreign policy. Again, what happened, I think, with the State Department in the last few years is that um, a lot of people there really got taken by the idea that social media can change the world. And... Um, they put a few very bright young guys in charge and they gave them their own, you know, new media shop. And uh, they were basically running it very autonomously, thinking that, you know, new media will not have much of an impact on the rest of the U.S. foreign policy. And I think as we have seen in Iran, uh, with, you know, many other governments uh, looking at that famous contact between the State Department and Twitter, uh, you know, many other governments looked at it and started taking their own precautious measures against Twitter, against new media, against, you know, potential promotion of internet freedom. And uh, this shop, this new media, you know, territory in the State Department ended up having a lot of political consequences uh, that were never first seen by people who wanted to build that shop uh, at the beginning, right? So my advice in the book is actually 
instead of trying to create a separate pillar or trying to create a separate space uh, and a separate concept of internet freedom, what instead needs to be done is that we need to go and identify uh, you know, desk officers and people who are knowledgeable about Russia, China, Iran, or any of these other countries, and tell them something basic about the internet. Again, I don't think that the internet is so complex that you need a PhD in internet studies uh, to figure it out, right? It does two things. It reduces uh, costs of access to information and it facilitates collective action. Those two things are very important and are very easy to keep in mind, right? But you don't know what those two features will do in a given political or social environment, right? You don't know how it will influence the politics of Russia unless you know that you know, there is a problem with nationalism in Russia, and nationalists will probably use new media to facilitate their own collective action. Right? This is not an insight you will get even if you read all of the books about the internet. Right? This is where you really need to go and start reading books about Russia. Right? And it's the same about Iran, China, and, and every other country. And I think my main criticism with internet freedom policy so far is that it kind of pushes us away from this regional context and the regional background and then forces us to come up with very complex political and social theories with the internet as their only input. Right? And I don't think that we will actually move very far, we'll probably actually you know, cause a lot of harm uh, if we lose sight of the broader geopolitical context in which the internet is a player but it's one of the many players. There are many others, and uh, to predict how they will respond, uh, you do need some knowledge that extends beyond the internet. And unfortunately, uh, so far, uh, many politicians in this country have assumed that you know, knowing about the internet is enough.